So today we begin our series. Now, I'm good. I'm so happy this month. And I need you to make a promise to me. May, let's make a little covenant together, a promise, uh, that you'll be in church every Sunday this month by the grace of God. Somebody shout amen. amen. And I say that because I've got some guests coming, okay, who are going to come. I've been teaching on relationships for the last 21 years, okay? Uh, we've done Love R&B. We did uh, Love, Sex, and Relationships. How many have been with me a long time? Love, Sex, and Relationships. You remember that one? Love R&B. We did all kinds of stuff. So... Uh, this year, we're taking a slightly, uh, we're going up, okay? That's our theme this year, so we're going up. So I've got some guests coming in with me uh, to host with me and to feed uh, wisdom from the ancient texts of Scripture concerning relationships. And of course, when you study the cross, you'll realize the cross has a vertical and a horizontal dimension. And that represents also metaphorically and symbolically what Jesus told us of the two greatest commandments. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are what? Love God and love people okay love god and love people love god and love people that's the cross and so it worries me when people wear the cross but don't love people and so it's important that we're able to relate to each other but of course that goes into the deeper dimensions of romantic relationships also so we talk about relationship month we're not just dealing with romantic relationships but of course that is a ma major part of it and we're going to talk a little bit about that today as I take you into the shallow end of the pool. I'm so grateful. I said to Pastor Donna, I feel good this month because I can, I can just do the hors d'oeuvres, the, uh, the uh, appetizer, as my American friends would call it. And uh, I can leave all the main course stuff to all the guests who are coming in this week. You are, you are in for an amazing time this week. I mean, this month, I should say. This month is going to blow your mind with the wisdom and the teaching that these people I'm bringing in are going to be able to share with you guys. And so um, we're excited. I'm super excited. But today, today I want to do an introduction. So we're stepping into the shallow end of the pool. Shallow doesn't mean unimportant or irrelevant. It just means we're laying a little foundation. And I told you, I think those of you saw the video we posted, this month is less about preaching. Okay, I can preach. You know, we can preach, we can have a good time, and we can celebrate and be inspirational. We, we get a lot of that. But this month is more, we're slowing the car right down to have more of a talk along with our teaching. And I thank those of you who are outside waiting and, and watching on the screens and on your phones, etc., in the car park and all the rest of it. Because I think it's important that we capture some of this stuff this month. And even if you're already married and happy and satisfied, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, but share the information with your children, share it with friends, make sure you pass this wisdom on that will be shared from the ancient writ of the holy text. So, today I want to really talk about family, but I'm, I'm going to call it couple goals. Look at your neighbor and say couple goals. I want to talk about couple goals, okay? But we're really focusing on family because actually that phraseology, couple goals, though it may be quite contemporary, Though it might be a uh, language that we're familiar with in the context of our 21st century <sighs> vernacular. Actually, the goals or the goal, I should say, the primary goal is really to cultivate family. Family. And I know that's gone out of fashion in some people's context because family uh, seems maybe slightly skewered in this 21st century context we find ourselves. But family is a major deal to God. And prophetically, prophetically, I don't think we speak enough. And when I say prophetic, I'm not talking about telling you what you did last summer or what your phone number is. I'm talking about speaking to the things in culture, whether it be organized by the powers that be that are trying to skewer, trying to blur, trying to remove some of the old landmarks that God originally put in place, and that includes somebody shout family. So I want to read a particular scripture just to open us up today, and then we're going to keep moving through. Number one, I want to go to Proverb. Go to Proverb. Put my Proverb scripture up on screen for me, screen team. Proverb chapter 24, verse 3 to 4. And it says this, uh, By wisdom a house is built. And through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. I'm going to read it again for you. By wisdom, let's read it together. It's a little bit so we can read it together. One, two, three, go. By wisdom, a house is built. 
and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Interesting here, we're reading one of what we call the wisdom books of the Bible. Wisdom books of the Bible. And I love the fact that it actually mentions here wisdom first of all. It's one of the wisdom books of the Bible. And interestingly, when we talk about the wisdom books of the Bible, we associate them with wise guys like Solomon. But oftentimes, the wisdom is presented to us. Those of you who've studied theology, you'll know this already. Uh, those of us who lecture in theology, uh, we teach this all the time. But many people miss things because they see things literally. But actually, this is speaking poetically, figuratively, of a family. What do you mean family? I don't see the word family there, Pastor. What are you talking about? I don't see it there. I'm, I'm glad you don't see it now. I can teach you. Because actually, the house that is built is not brick and mortar it's speaking about. The house is talking about the family. Much like how in the fashion industry, you have the house of Versace. The house of Gucci. Uh, the house of Fendi. You have, you have all these houses. Okay, forget the fashion industry. Seeing as you're going to act like you don't know nothing about fashion. Let me take you into history. <laughs> You've got the house of the Tudors, the house of the Windsors. The house then is speaking about a family. Somebody shout a family. So it says, by wisdom, a family in essence is built. Then it goes further in the poetic language. And it says, through understanding, it is established. You, you need to establish. Establish means it has foundations. It has rigidity. It's concretized. It has firmness. It's set through understanding. Okay, now, now not just knowledge, not just knowledge, but understanding, okay? Because you can know stuff, but how you understand the stuff you know actually helps with the harmonization within a family and understanding when we, how we go forward together. So, so I want you to recognize this there, through understanding it is what? Somebody shout, establish. Through knowledge now, it's rooms, the rooms, the rooms in the family, the rooms in the family, the rooms, the finance room, the health room. The mother and father room, the children's room, all these different rooms. And so it's poetic language speaking to us about the establishment of a family or a house. God tells us by wisdom a house is built. Now, oh Lord, here we go. I forgot to tell you, this month is going to be rough. Okay? As those of you who are part of the Tab Church family for the last few years, you'll know that February month we get 100% real. Okay? So uh, get ready, fasten your seatbelt, push your neighbor and say, it only gets worse from here. Go on, tell it. <laughs> so if you're prudish, if you are a little bit, this is the, the, the context and the culture of our church. We keep things 100% real because actually, if you don't speak the truth, people can't be set free. Okay? And so understanding this then, we recognize that God is obsessed. God is so obsessed with family. He said somebody who does not take care of their family, he says is worse than an unbeliever. He, 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 says, he says he can't deal with people like that. People, people who don't take, have you ever been driving? I don't know if I can give you some practical thoughts here. I, I've been driving sometimes down the road and you see somebody in their car with their baby in the back in a car seat. Anybody ever seen that? And they're in the car and the windows are rolled up and they're there smoking. And, and if you're a parent, that climbs deep on the inside of you. And, and so, so you get offended because you're like, how can you not take care of your family? Okay? It's interesting here. Uh, the language even that we understand, the language we understand when it comes to family is interesting in the English language. Isn't it interesting how the Bible says a good man or a good person leaves an inheritance to who? Their children's children. Can we teach a little bit in here? Leaves an inheritance to their children's children. Their children's children. Their children's children. So a good man. Watch this now. A good man. A good man. Stay with me. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. A good person. Not just man, but a good person. A good human. A good person. A good person. Somebody shout good. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. Good now. Leaves an inheritance to their children's children. So, so if, you leave a, if you leave an inheritance to your children's children, that now qualifies you as being not just good, but grand. Some of you missed it. You're now a grandparent. You're, you're catching that? 
Okay, okay. And the reason you leave an inheritance to your children's children is so that they can take care of those children. So now those children look back and they say, you're our, you're our great. Some of you missed it. Some of you missed it. So you go from good to grand to great. The titles we use in our English language speak to us of the potency of somebody who's looking out for the family even in future generations. God is obsessed with family, man. He says he places the lonely, book of Psalms, in families. Families, 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 families. God is obsessed with families. And the problem is our culture is trying to deconstruct and ultimately destroy what God already put in place. Okay. And somebody needs to speak up and be bold enough to say that we need to put back in place family. Family, family. Why, 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 pastor? Why do we need to put back in place family? Because actually family, and I know this isn't, this isn't uh, rocket science, this isn't mind-blowing revelation, but it's very relevant. Because family becomes the first institution that gives you schooling for your formation. And your formation is ultimately what leads to your maturation. Oh God. And so, so your family now, your family, the family becomes the thing that actually beca becomes the undergirding of society. The undergirding of society. If we don't have family, then if families get messed up, then society gets messed up. That's why the enemy goes for family. Because if he can destroy family, he's gone upstream to corrupt society. Oh my God. I've taught you before, that's why I call it your, your, your family is your soil. If you are a seed of greatness, if you are a seed of greatness, every one of us is a seed of greatness in here. Every one of us. Push your neighbor just in case they didn't know. I say, hey, you're great. You're great, you're great. But tell them you're a seed. You're a seed. There's potential on the inside of you. If every one of us is a seed of greatness, then seed has to be placed in soil. And those of you who've been under the teaching long enough know that I teach on soil. I write on soil. And I talk about soil being an acronym. It stands for your start out in life. S-O-I-L. Your soil. That's your soil. That's where you... Now, now here's, here's the interesting thing to me. Because if family becomes your soil, then really and truly you need to check out the soil before you marry somebody who may be a seed. Because maybe the soil is going to corrupt that seed and maybe you're marrying somebody who's got an infection, who's got actually immaturity. And so you end up hooking up with somebody for a lifetime who actually, if you'd have checked out the soil, you'd have realized that really that's probably somebody I should avoid anyway. They tell me, they tell me, they tell me, they tell me, they tell me. And I think we've talked about this before, but they tell me onions, somebody's your onions. Now, you know, you know, those of you who are chefs, culinary experts, you know, onions are important when it comes to cooking. I need the church to say, praise the Lord. They tell me onions, what, when you cut an onion and it releases the, 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 the pores, the pores of it release this, this moisture into the atmosphere. And that moisture, those micro levels of moisture, these molecules that cause you to cry. They tell me, actually, that's not really caused by the onion. When you study botanical studies, it's not the onion that, <laughs> that's the issue. It's actually what the onion is took in from the soil okay so 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 you cut you cut the onion and you say the onion's making me cry but actually it's something that came out of the soil that went into the onion you check it out for yourselves i know you google me anyway <laughs> check it out for yourself it's it's the soil it's what is receiving from the soil that causes a chemical a reaction that then goes into the onion and releases something that makes you cry. Maybe some of you are crying in so many relationships because you didn't check out the soil that the person came from. Lean on your neighbor, say it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get it's gonna get worse than this. It's gonna get worse than this. <laughs> understand the soil the start out in life I need to check out where did they come from what's their relationship like with their parents what what what, what does somebody in their family what, what's, what's the worst thing that's happened in your family what family trauma you've been through because before I connect my future to your now I need to check out what the soil is you come from bro babe sis I don't care if you've got hip slips and fingertips mountains and valleys in the right places big back and six pack I don't care about all of that It's going to get worse, far worse. Okay. I don't care about all of that. I need to check out your soil, your surround. What did you come out of? Got to check that out. Check that out. Check that out. God is obsessed with families. 
And he says, it's, it's by wisdom, it's by wisdom a, a, a family is built. You've got to check out the different rooms, the different rooms in the house of the family. It's interesting because actually by wisdom, here's the problem with us as church people. Can I talk to us a little bit? I'm going to pass to you. I ain't come to be an evangelist. I've come to be a pastor today. And I need you guys to understand that somebody in the church needs to rise up and recognize that we cannot accept ourselves as being part of the world in the way the world does things. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to. We are not the world. I'm going to say it for louder for the people at the back. We are not the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. So we can't do things like the world does it. We can't do things like the world does it. Look what the Bible says here. It's interesting here. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, what happens with the world? Look what God thinks of the worldly wisdom. It says, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise, watch this, by the standards of this age, you should become fools. That you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. This world thinks they're wise by finding out about body counts. Instead of bank accounts. I need to know what's going on. What's going on? How do you handle money? Because that could mess up our future. And I, it's not just, this is what the world, this is what the podcasts are talking about. is body counts and catfishing and all kinds of foolishness. And can you get yourself a bad, and all, all this foolish, this is the world's wisdom. Well, Lord, I need to preach to my Gen Z's, my Gen Y's. Lord have mercy. We are not of the world. It don't work. Worldly wisdom does not work. If you're going to go with what the world tells you, then you're going to end up in a mess. They don't like me today. If I can tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, so the child back, amen. amen. We are not the world. God says, for the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. You're going out on dates, and we know everybody's preached about it. I preached about it 20 years ago, talking about getting, you're going on dates for data. We understand all of that. You're going out there, but you, the data you're looking for is body counts. Look at your neighbor and say, what's wrong with you? Come on, I'll ask him. <laughs> what in the world? What about their bank account? How, how do they handle money? What's your plan for your future? What's the worst thing that's happened financially in your family history? What do you not want to be an echo of, but want to be a new voice in the lineage of your family? And so I, I need to know that stuff. That's what we need to talk about. Jeez. This, this is what the worldly wisdom gets us. If you came for a hoop today or a shout, this is the wrong service, guys. Come back in March. We're going to talk about something happier. But I need you to understand, this is, what the, this is what the world's wisdom's got us. Look at this, just, just some media articles, look at this, look at this. They're telling us the worldly wisdom, because you know, we're hypersexualized. Everybody wants some. Okay, take it off screen, take it off screen. It's not on screen, it's on my screen, okay. Because everybody wants some, everyone say everybody, certain people. Certain, push your neighbor and say, that's somebody else you're talking about. <laughs> listen to me listen to me and, and, and worldly wisdom is crazy because we're hyper sexualized and don't realize the spirit behind causing destruction in our generation and there's nothing wrong with sex nothing wrong with sex sex is God's creation okay so don't, so don't get weird about sex in fact in fact everybody in this room proves that sex Push your neighbor and say, you are the evidence. You are the evidence. Tell them. Because it took. <laughs> I'm going to do that emoji for you, you know, because. Listen, listen, here's, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. When we, when, we, when we take what God has created and then we allow it to become corrupted by following the patterns of this world, we end up with blurred lines and messed up lives. Messed up lives. Look at look what he says here. It's telling, us, it's telling us now, they've done the statistical research and they found out that one in 10 people in Britain have been told 
who their father is, is the wrong person. Okay, I'm going to say it for the people at the back. <sighs> one in ten people. Okay, okay. Up to one in ten Britons don't know who their real father is. That's the first headline. But genetic tests are revealing one in ten people in the UK have a different father from who they were told. Okay. Okay. Push your neighbor say blurred lines, blurred lines. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, all right. What, what about what about what about the worldly wisdom? Concern? Is this all right to you? Is this good? What about the what about the? Can we talk about this? Because I got a young, I got a whole load of young people in my church. I want I want to save your future. I want you guys to become the most dynamic, powerful, mature family building people in the world. Watch this here. Watch this. All right. So so we all want some sex. We want some sex. So here's what worldly wisdom said. What's it say? Where, where, is this too much, guys? I, yeah. Come on now, I'm trying to be, I've got guests in it from America and everything. I'm trying to behave myself. Can we preach like we want to preach? Can we? Okay. Watch this now. Worldly wisdom tells us, okay, this is what we do. Okay, we need, to, we, we need sex, but, we, but we, we, we don't check out soil. And so we're jumping in and out of bed, fresh from carnival with our nasty selves. Sorry, was that, was that, I told you, is this, I don't know, you all are making me nervous. I just want to keep, I want to talk to, I want to talk to us like we're a family. Push your neighbor and say, this is family business, come on now. Maybe we should take the E-Tribe, I don't know if you're ready for this, Lord. There's not one pastor can steal this message today, this is too much. <laughs> Watch this here. <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. And so what, what, what we've got now, what we've got now just announced, you all would have seen it, that we are breaking the NHS. Watch this now. BBC News has report, reported gonorrhea and syphilis sex infections reach record levels in England. This, this, ain't, this, is, this is this year. Look, 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 look at this. Gonorrhea and syphilis sex infections reach record levels in England. This is, this, look, look at the date here. 6th of June 2023. You'd have, thought, you'd have thought, once that announcement got out, okay, okay. <laughs> you'd have thought, once that announcement got out, we'd have behaved ourselves. Look at this year. This year, put the economists on screen. The economists, look what the economists are saying. They, they had, now, now they've got to say just, why, 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 why does London have so much? Sexually transmitted disease. This is now this year. So you think after we heard it last year or the year before, we'd have all behaved ourselves. No, because what we're saying is no, what we need to do is we need to address it downstream. Let's give out more prophylactics. We need more prophylactics. Let's encourage people to use more prophylactics. And I'm not against that. I think that's a wise thing. But what I'm trying to say is that's downstream. Prophylactics. You, you all know what Condoms. Something like that. Prof yes, pro professional. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's downstream we need to go upstream and figure out what what is is it in the worldly wisdom that we're following that we think actually is going to help and save a generation okay all right all right Th then here's another reason why you need to be careful who you choose lord have mercy i'm gonna get in trouble now Woo, jesus are you sure jesus Oh, Lord. Then now, 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 this is just one, and, and this is one from, from the States. Um, but you've got arguments now going on amongst couples because they didn't first out establish what their understanding is concerning children. So now look at this article here. New York father. New York father loses legal battle to stop his son, nine-year-old son, eight-year-old son rather, from taking puberty blockers to change gender. So, so the battle, the court battle is between him and the ex-wife, him, him and the person he was married to. Over, She believes that the son has a right, even from his infancy, to make decisions about his own sexuality and future. He believes that's wrong. Now there's this big feud and the child is caught up between it. And he loses the battle. How do you lose a battle like that in court? 
You lose a battle like that in court because you're fo- because even the courts are often following worldly wisdom. Okay. Okay. Is this too much for you? Okay. So, 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 so we need to address and talk about some stuff this month. I told you, I'm just doing an introduction today. I'm feeling good. I've got the easy job. Hors d'oeuvres. You just walk around with a tray, take one. Main course, etc., is coming for the rest of this month. But I need you to understand that there is a dilemma when we start following worldly wisdom. And it doesn't take long. Let me tell you something. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take long if you're not careful and if you're not plugged into a source. Lord, I wish, last, I was going to do this last week. Now I'm just thinking I should have done it this week. But if you're not plugged into God, if you're not plugged in and on fire for God, If you are not on fire for God, it doesn't take long before you become like the world. Here's the issue. Here's the issue. You'll know the scripture. You'll know the scripture. Uh, bring it up on screen. Uh, screen to me if you can. Uh, Revelations. I, I, I want to talk, talk about how important it is for you not to follow the patterns of the world. You've got to remain on fire for God. Look what God says to the church. He says to the church, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out. Oh my God, oh oh my God, neither hot nor cold, neither hot nor cold. We we can't tell what you are. Are you kingdom or are you not kingdom? Are you church or are you not church? Do you believe God's way or don't you believe God's way? Are you trying to rearrange God's way so it fits your way to make you more comfortable so you can keep following the patterns of this world? Are you hot or cold? Ask your neighbor, come on, challenge them like a prophet. Say, are you hot or cold? Ask them. Because God says, I don't do no, nobody, listen to me, listen to me, nobody walks into Starbucks and orders, can I have a lukewarm hot chocolate? (laughs) Nobody goes to McDonald's, pulls up at the drive-thru and says, you know, give me one of those lukewarm milkshakes. (laughs) I'm trying to make it practical for you. But yet what happens is this. If, if you, I can't use that because that's going to spoil my example, but if you take a hot drink, and most of people, most people are hot when they first come to Christ. You're on fire for God. Woo, you're on fire for God. We can see it in your praise, in your commitment to the house, in the way you deal with people, in how you talk. We can feel your fire for God. But what happens is this, if you sit in a room, if I sat a hot drink, this is what I was going to do last week. If I sat a hot drink in this room, hot drink, I just sat it in the room. Over time, the room does not adjust to the drink. The drink will adjust to the room because it does not have a source that it's plugged into. Oh, y'all are making me work hard. To keep it on fire. And what the enemy wants to do is cut you off from the source so you start adjusting to the culture, adjust to the room of the world until you become lukewarm and then after a while you start following worldly wisdom. Now, now the word of God and the preaching isn't good enough for you. Now you need to go and check out some crazy podcast who just ordained themselves yesterday. Who's telling you what you, your flesh wants to hear. Not what's good for you. Because not everything that sounds good to you is good for you. Lord, you all look scared. Last thing I want is to be lukewarm. God says lukewarm stuff he spits out. Yeah, your, your God said that. Yes. Yes. He says I spit it out because I don't like stuff that adjusts to the room temperature. If the room temperature is corrupt, is blurred, and it's worldly wisdom. And in our relationships, we cannot do what the world does because it's ended up with crazy levels of mental health. STDs on the rocket rise. And we're sitting there talking about, well, what we should do is just give out more prophylactics. When your family should have been the first school that helped with your formation and ultimately your maturation. 
This is why God is obsessed with family. However, families begin with couples. Families begin with couples. That's where the families are born from. And what's interesting here is whether you are a biological parent or a spiritual parent or you've just decided just to take on parenting over certain people that you see actually need some godly wisdom, that's beautiful. You are helping cultivate family. Am I helping anybody in here? If I am, shout back amen. amen. I want you to understand this here. So, so here's the challenge though with the couples. So we are in another dilemma which needs to be addressed and we're going to address some of this this month. Told you I'm just unpacking today's just an intro. This is the other thing. We've got fears. Now the Bible says God has not given us what? The spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. Sound mind means you're thinking right. That's what God gives you. This is why it marries up when God says he will, listen, if you delight yourself in God, he, that's what the Bible says, if you delight yourselves in God, he will give you the desires of your heart. Now we've heard this preached many times, but sometimes we forget that delight, delight. If you study the original language, the picture metaphor that can be used to help unpack delight, it's like being in a sheet or a duvet, being wrapped up, cozy, tucked up. It says when you're tucked up in God, when you delight yourself in God, when you're tucked up in him, not half in, half out, but when you're tucked up in him, it says he will give you your heart's desire. Right? Right? Wrong. It says when you wrap yourself up in God, he will give you the desires of, he will give your heart new desires. See, it's when you come to God and you're fully wrapped up in God, you start thinking differently now. You don't, you don't want to have the same old conversations now. You don't want to get involved in the same old mess and the same old drama. You sometimes only watch the same old stuff because it doesn't do stuff for you anymore because you're now wrapped up in God. Now watch this, please don't miss it. If God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, he doesn't give us fear, then any fear you're carrying has, that's not of God has been inherited from the culture. Okay, okay. I, you hear me talking about fear all the time. You know I study psychology uh, and, and sociology, and those of you who, in the church who are members, who I know we've got many people who are psychotherapists and counselors, etc. I love that because our church strongly believes in God and therapy. Okay, And what's interesting here is that actually we are only born, we are only born really with two primary fears. The two primary fears we're born with, every human being is born, put innate. If you watch our responses, you know that. We're born with a fear, a response. And I use fear loosely here because it's a response that actually shows that there's an alert, an alarm put in us for these things. And that's the fear of falling, number one falling ain't nobody ain't nobody falling and don't stretch out their hands automatically because it's built in you to know that a collision impact is not good and so you're built with a fear of actually the collision so naturally you're programmed to try and put your hands out even if your hands ain't gonna do nothing you're gonna try and save yourself also the fear of loud noises if you hear a bang or a pop your body is programmed to send your eyes on a mission to find out what it is and nobody hears a loud sound and goes, I wonder what that was. <laughs> Everybody sends your eyes because we are programmed psychologically that way. But what's interesting here is this. There are new fears. There are three to four hundred new fears that have been actually highlighted just over the last ten years. That culture, as culture becomes weirder, blurred, stranger, new fears start being adopted by human beings. And we rebuke fear in the name of Jesus in the church. But here's two fears that they've seen coming up, and I can understand them. I can, I'm going to be honest with you, I can understand them. One fear is called gamophobia. We've talked about this before, those of you who remember. Gamophobia, gamophobia, and then the other fear is called anoptophobia. Here's the, pra here's the problem. Gamophobia is the fear of commitment. Gamophobia is the fear of commitment, especially regarding marriage. And they're telling us that in this generation, there's a lot of men with that fear. Fear of commitment. Yes, brothers, I'm talking to you real quick. So we go into serial monogamy. Oh, Lord. And then you've got the other fear, which is, another, which, here we go, anoptophobia. Anoptophobia is the fear of remaining single or unmarried. 
Oh my gosh. These two fears are hovering in the atmosphere of culture right now. Now, when I say fear, you might not see somebody actually shaking, but you can tell based on some of their conversation and based on some of their expression that they're carrying these fears. And it's the enemy trying to sow negativity into the minds of some of these men. I remember when I got married at 26, people were saying to me, people, this is worldly people, were saying, 26? 26? What, what, why, why would you do that? Why? There's so much out there. Like, 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 here's the problem with our generation again. You go back a few generations, they were getting married at 16. They, in, in World War I, they were commanding ships at 17. Flying missions at 17 in war, commanding battalions at 17 and 16, writing letters home. One of the most amazing things, because I'm a nerd, I read this crazy stuff. I love reading sometimes some of the letters that if you do historical studies, that some of these 16 and 17 year olds were writing back home to their families. While out there in Flanders fields, while out there commanding ships, while out there flying planes. It's only our generation. In fact, the very word, Lord Jesus, I'm going all over the place today, but the very word teenager, you know, the word teenager is a new construct. You go back just a few years. Go back just a few decades and that word wasn't even popular. It's our culture that's created this teenager thing. Oh my God. Because they expected maturity wasn't measured based on age. But our culture has corrupted it. Man, you're, you're in... You're, you're. And so what we're telling them is don't get married, don't get married. The culture saying don't get married, just have serial monogamy. Just one woman after the other woman after the other woman. Like, 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 like Adam chose a rack rather than a rib. It was a rib, it was one. And, but we're telling them, no, 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 just, just keep, keep choosing, keep picking, keep picking, keep picking. Keep picking, keep picking, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then we're ending up, instead of creating what the Bible had, which was lineage, we end up with bushes. When you study biblically, you realize we call each other king. You know, nowadays, king, yes, king, yes, king, king. You ain't no king unless you've got a kingdom. And you, if you've got a kingdom, you'll want a queen to help you build that kingdom. Society respects married men, men who've committed to wanting to build a kingdom with a queen, not just a baddie. Now, don't get me wrong, you need to try and look good. I, I, that's that, that's going to come later in the, in the months. <laughs> but understand the fact that we're corrupting mindsets. Lord have mercy. Then you've got the ladies over here. Because they got, they got the biological clock. They got all this other stuff going on where society almost makes them feel like they are nothing if they've not got someone. And so then they walk around with anoptophobia. And I found out that some of these ladies aren't even built for marriage. And that's not a bad thing. Because not everybody necessarily is built for marriage. You've got some people who are single and satisfied. got these fears in the atmosphere culture culture because we're going according to the wisdom of this world when God wants couples he wants people building families because family is the undergirding of society my god all right next <laughs> I told you we're just talking to them we're just talking to them uh, so, so let's see what Jesus said Jesus, whenever the topic, and, and this is interesting, in Matthew chapter 19, the topic of relationships, marriage, divorce, all kinds of stuff, can you just leave somebody, should you stay with the same person, all this language, all this conversation happened in Matthew 19. And it's something, it's a phrase in Matthew 19 that Jesus repeated. He said this phrase once and he said it twice, and that means if there's a double enunciation of deity, whenever deity, God, says something twice, you need to pay attention, you need to listen, he's laying foundation. This is why when Jesus often spoke, he said, verily, verily, I say unto thee. 
When, when, when you go back into the Old Testament, if he's calling somebody who's about to have a complete paradigm shift in humanity, he'll say, Abraham, Abraham. He'll say, Moses, Moses. Say my name, say my name. <laughs> that double enunciation means that, listen, something's about to shift here. You're about to get a paradigm shift, a revelation, an insight, something really important is about to be said. And he says this thing twice in Matthew chapter 19. Put it on screen, screen team for me. Matthew 19, the Bible says, he says, haven't you read? So they're questioning him about relationships, marriage, divorce. Can you stay with the same person? Should you leave them? What should happen? All this relationship conversation. And he says, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. Oh, Jesus, have mercy. I won't get in trouble, man. I'll just blame you. He said, he says, the creator made them male and female. Stay with me, stay with me. My Bible class crew, my Wednesday night live crew, you know this, you've heard this, but let me bring it to the main house. He says, at the, in the beginning, the, at the beginning, at the beginning, at the beginning, at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Here's what I want to talk about real quick. I want to talk about the beginning, but before I get to the beginning, I've got to show you what it says. Because I've heard some people say to me, well, pastor, uh, the, Jesus never explicitly talked about what kind of genders should really be married in accordance with a faith marriage. I'm not talking about civil partnership. Civil partnership, you do what you do with your civil partnership. But I'm talking about when it comes to the Christian faith. Oh, Lord. I'm going to lose friends, make more enemies. Notice what he says here. Don't miss the specificity of the text. It says here, haven't you read, he replied, that the, at the beginning, God created, he, the creator made them male and female. Th then he says here, therefore, what God has joined together, not who. He says, what God has joined together, male and female. You all thought it was the who. No, 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 it says what male and female. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder, even though the world is now trying to put that asunder. Okay, okay, okay. Somebody needs to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Push your neighbor and say, here's the truth, here's the truth. Within faith, within the Christ faith. He says what God, what, not who. We, we quote it as who God has joined together. No, it says what. It's talking specifically about the genders. What God has joined together, male and female, the world even shouldn't put it asunder. Don't try and deconstruct and destroy what. I, I'm trying to check who's caught it. I, push your neighbor and say, what, not who. Go on, tell them. Watch this here. Stay with me. But here's the phrase. He says, he says go back to the beginning. He, he then repeats it. Look at it again. He says here in verse, what's this? Verse 8, he says, they ask him again. They're still pushing more information. You're not saying what we want you to hear, Jesus. Tell us what we want to hear. He says, no, no, no. He says, it was not this way from the beginning. When he talks about the beginning, what's he talking about? He's talking about Genesis, the book of beginnings. Not the beginning of the law, not Moses, those of you are theologically apt. He's talking about the beginning as in Genesis. He says, all, all you're doing, all the world is doing, no, 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 it's become so crazy, become so blurred, we need to go back to the beginning. If you go back to the beginning, you see what things should have been, what the best track was. And so when we go back to the beginning, we could go back to the beginning in Genesis, and there's three interesting couples in Genesis, three interesting couples. We could talk quickly about Noah. We could talk about Abraham. Abraham, you remember Abraham? Abraham. That was a family, Abraham and his family, the father of the faith. Abraham and his family, God said to them, come out from among all your old kindred and I will show you a new land. You keep marching on. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your name great. It's interesting right there already we get the lesson in the life of Abram. Abram, his name was changed to Abraham. Abram means father, high father, but Abraham means father of many. Watch that now. Abram to Abraham. Abram to Abraham. Abram to Abraham. Five, five, high father, high father, high father to father of many. And that was before he even had any children. 
So before he had any children, God says, I still want your language to change. Because your communication is going to help shift your situation. So you need to have a family that's able to have communication that speaks about their future, not about their current situation. Can start speaking to your blessing, speaking to your prosperity, speaking to your protection. Speak, come on somebody. Abraham teaches us so much stuff in his family. I didn't come to talk about Abraham, though I could talk about Noah. Noah's interesting because Noah connects with what we just talked about. What does Noah talk about? Noah, of course, you remember Noah? Noah, he again, God appoints a family. Noah and his family and the ark. Remember the whole ark situation? What I find fascinating is once Noah gets off the ark. Once Noah gets off the ark, Noah has now had a successful mission. He and his family are successful. Noah plants a vineyard. Noah starts drinking uh, the grapes, uh, making wine. He starts drinking. He gets drunk in the vineyard and it creates a mess. He gets drunk of his own success. What's interesting here with Noah, though, what I love is that when Noah, when you go back into his history, Noah was called by God and his family, Noah and his family, to build, build something for the future, even while the culture is laughing at you. Oh, my God. So that means the person I need to marry needs to be somebody who, who is more prepared to follow God's word, follow God's instructions, even though the culture might think we're strange. I, I could spend a lot of time on both of those guys. But what I want to real knock out real quick, as we finish up, I want to knock out some things, some lessons from Adam and Eve, because the real beginning is Adam and Eve. Let me give you a few lessons, just some lessons. They're not going to rhyme, they're not going to chime, but they are relevant lessons that I think we can extract quickly from the life of Adam and Eve, the first family. The first family. It's interesting here because actually when you read about the first family, you'll find out something here. Number one, I want you to recognize that God, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1, if you go around about from verse 27, it tells us that God blessed them. This is going to be a family. Isn't it interesting? Did you ever notice how the devil does not show up while Adam is alone? No Lucifer, no snake, no hissing, nobody hissing him off. No, no, no drama, but the moment there's potential for a family. Now here comes Lucifer, shrouded, camouflaged, subtle, to try and infiltrate what he knows will bring God glory. But I love the phrase here, it says, God blessed them. Notice the blessing was not just on Adam. The blessing was on a them. Oh my God, oh my God, blessing, blessing, the blessing was on them. Now here's the thing, as you're looking for somebody, those of you who are single and searching or dating in a dilemma, as you're looking for somebody, you need somebody who recognizes, here's the phrase, the power of partnership. Not just somebody who just wants a good time, not just somebody who wants somebody just to serve them, but somebody who understands there is power in partnership. I'm going to do these real quick, so I need you to write them down real quick. The power of partnership. What do you think? While I'm on that day, I need to ask them, what do you think about partnership? What, what, what is it that you're going to bring? What do, you, what do you think you could bring to a relationship? What could I bring to a relationship? Not just your dress looks nice. Not just you look sexy. Not just you smell good. Not, and sometimes that's why it's not always good to go out where you're made drunk, not on alcohol, but on the atmosphere, so you don't ask the right questions. What do you think about partnership? What could we, what could you build together with somebody? What can we build together? Because the blessing comes on them. My God. Partnership. God blessed them. I, I need to make sure that whoever I'm connecting with, that the blessing can rest on us. Okay. I don't want to marry somebody or be with somebody that the little blessing that I had Oh, oh, this is too much. Let's leave that for week two or three or something. The little blessing that you had, just, just, as my mother would say, my mother's from Jamaica, so she said, just gone, sir. <laughs> Which means it's gone. It's traveled. Okay? It's no longer existing. Your peace has been snatched. Lord have mercy. No, 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 no. My, my, my self-esteem is now gone. No, no. I need the blessing to rest on them, on a us, on a we. There is power. What do you think about partnership? 
Now, we use that language in this generation frivolously. Oh, that's my partner. Really? <laughs> Instead of, that's my friend who I wash his clothes and we sleep together. <laughs> well, Lord Jesus. It's, it's, I keep having to check on you guys. You know, it's like the children. You're everything good? You good? Everything, everything all right? The power of partnership. Look at this. Look at this. I'm going to keep it moving. Watch this here. Look at this. Please don't miss this. Don't miss this. Oh, my God. Look at verse 28 of the same Genesis chapter 1. I'm still in Genesis chapter 1. I want you to notice this. He says, he says to them, the command is not to rule necessarily. The command here is be fruitful and increase in number. Be fruitful and increase in number. Be fruitful and increase in number. Now, I want to say two things to that. There's a fruitfulness that needs to happen in a marriage before you have children. S burn all these comments. I'll try to say it as posh as possible. <laughs> we're, we're culturally, we're pushing people to have children when they haven't yet been rooted. Especially in the black community. We're, we're hungry for them to have kids. They've been married, they got married last week. And we're like, any children yet? Rather than allowing them to be grounded. And, and if you succumb to what others are saying, you'll produce children, but you've got no fruitful environment for them to grow in. So you and him are struggling to pay bills, let alone bringing along number three. He says, be fruitful first. Now, in our, in our illiterate theological interpretation, we think that be fruitful. We think that be fruitful and increase in number means the same thing. No, be fruitful and multiply. I don't want more of you if you're not fruitful first. We don't want you to produce more and more unfruitful versions of you. Lord, they don't like it. No, the world don't need no more of you, bro. We don't know, we're good, we're good. One is enough. <laughs> we want to see you be fruitful before you increase in number. Number two, I'm staying with that fruitful thing. When you meet somebody, find out where they are fruitful. Because you don't want to partner with somebody who has no fruit in some area of their life. Are you fruitful in your workplace? Are you fruitful in the business you're running? Are you fruitful in the fact that you're trying to study and, and achieve something? Is there fruit? Are you just there? I, just there makes no sense to me. There needs to be fruitfulness. Even Jesus cursed the tree that produced no fruit. Because you are violating your creational mandate. Your creational mandate is not to take up sustenance and produce nothing. I need to see something. I know the tree had leaves. So you look good, but you're producing nothing. Jesus cursed that joke. He says, oh no, may you never produce fruit. Because you're a fake, you look good. You've got Gucci, Louis, Fendi, you've got red bottoms, you, you, everything looks good, every, but actually there's no fruit in you. I wanna see, show me where there's fruitfulness. Because here's my phrase, if there is no fruit, then it's a sign there is no root. And if you're gonna connect with somebody, you need to make sure they're grounded. They are grounded. They are grounded. They got roots to them. Show me where your fruitfulness is. Are you fruitful even in ministry? Is there fruitfulness in your spiritual life? Is there fruitfulness in, in, in how, you, how you do with church, how you do with God? Show me some area. While I'm dating, while I'm talking to you, I want to find, before you even, re don't recommend nobody to me and my saved, feeling good single self who ain't fruitful. As a family, when you see somebody else who's single and you're sick, you say, you know what, I know somebody, you know, I know somebody, I know somebody else, you know. No, before you send them to that person, check out, is that person fruitful? Oh, no. No, be fruitful, then increase. Somebody shout, fruit, fruit. then increase. Here we go. Watch this here. I'm going to knock this out real quick. Don't miss this. Verse 15 of chapter 2 is interesting. I'm going from chapter 1 to chapter 2 and I'm working at rocket speed here. Watch this. Please don't miss it. He says to the man in particular, but I think this applies to everybody. He says to the man, 
Watch this now. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. Somebody shout Eden. Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Watch this now. To work it and take care of it. Somebody shout work it. Work. Somebody shout take care of it. Yeah. Here's the thing. You must have an Eden before you get an Eve. Show me what you can take care of to prove you can take care of a marriage. Because I'm sick and tired of these people who think that marriages are made in heaven and that's it. No, marriages are made in heaven but they're managed on earth. You can have a match made in heaven but it's managed on earth. Show me what else you've managed. Oh Lord. And sings my soul. What have you managed? I want, this is the stuff we're looking for now. Forget body counts and all the rest of that. Obsessed with this. What about relevant questions? This is somebody you're going to invest your entire future with. Where is your Eden? Show me your Eden. Do you have an Eden in the workplace? Is there an Eden in church? Is there an Eden in the ministry? Is there, I want to see your, you don't deserve, you can't afford an Eve. If you cannot take care of an Eden. If God showed Adam. Oh Lord. I wish I could mix stuff up here. And give you some clarity. I feel like a DJ. Because you see Adam was a gardener. Gardeners need to learn how to handle certain soil. If you can't handle the soil right here. What's the soil going to be that you produce with Eve? Okay, okay, all right. Preach, pastor, preach, preach. Watch this. Stay with me, stay with me. Uh, okay, now, this one, this one's important. This one's very important. All of them are important, but this one I want you to hear. <laughs> I wish I could just buy everybody Nando's and we could just sit down in a big room and talk like a family because sometimes some stuff, the, the, the culture of preaching that we've curated doesn't help. We need some real talk and conversation so that we can digest some stuff to save a generation. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to stay in Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to notice what the NIV renders. Don't miss it. Write this down. Quick, 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 quick. Write this down. Look how the NIV re renders this. It says this. Put it on screen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. The Lord God said, it is not good. This is after he's now established in Eden. He's now the king of Eden, so he needs a queen. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper. Am I helping anybody in here? If you are, if I'm helping. Somebody shout back amen if I'm helping. Let me just do a quick book barometer check. Watch this now. I will make a helper suitable for him. Please, my English graduates, watch this. He says, I'll make a helper suitable for him. A helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds, but for Adam no suitable helper was found. Stay with me. A helper suitable for him. And he compares the helper suitable to him for him with the wild. Okay, okay. So, so a helper suitable. You must find somebody who... Uh, just because they look good doesn't mean they suit you. I'm going to tell you the truth, as big as I am. I've seen some suits. That I'm like, that suit's bad. And I kept walking. Because it's not suit a bull for me. And some of you, just because something looks good, you think it's for you. Rather than working out what, what, what the suit ability. What abilities do you have that suit this situation? Oh God, Jesus have mercy. Lord, help me with this church today. 9.30, you're, you're the handling it. I'm worried about that 12.30 crowd. <laughs> But, but watch this. Love you, 1230, those of you watching online. Love you. <laughs> but watch this. So helper suitable. Helper suitable. Who compliments you? 
I, I preached on the sermon. You, you need to find the one that comes. What goes together? You can be different but go together. Gray and pink. They, they, they're different but they go together. A key and a lock. I, I, I've told you, come on, this ain't new to some of you. A key and a lock, a key and a lock. A key is a, all a key is, a Yale key. A Yale key or a Chubb key. Those of us in the UK, Javita, you'll understand that. A Yale key or a Chubb key. All they are, a key is a broken piece of metal. It's strategically broken by a machine into a certain strange shape. And that key fits a lock. A lock has a mechanism behind it, but to get to the mechanism, there's another piece of metal that's been broken. So you've got two pieces of metal that are broken. But when they get together, they fit and click. They're broken, but in the right places. So when you're looking for somebody suitable to you on the day, I need to find out where are you broken? That where I'm broken will fit and we can make a hole and click. Some of you ain't clicking because you're not getting with the right kind of people. Oh, Jesus have mercy. Okay. You're not looking for perfection. You're not looking for perfection. I'm looking for who's broken in the place that I can fit. And I'm broken in the place that they fit. Not perfection. Not front cover of Ebony. No, 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 not perfection. Nobody's perfect. Makes me laugh. I keep telling you all these people. All these people looking for perfect people. You know what makes me laugh? It's people who, who, who are looking. I want, you know what? I, I, want, I want him to have a, and he's got to have a six pack. He's got to be tall. He's got to be, he's got to be handsome. Listen, listen. And we look at you. You know, I like, I like, I like when, I like when he's got his top off and I see the V. And you got your alphabet messed up because you look like an O. Asking for V. A B C D F G H I J K eleven O. Find somebody like you so that when we see you walking down the street, we say, uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, forgive me. I apologize. Stay with me now. Come back home. Come back home. <laughs> Lean on your neighbor, say, uh oh, come on now. <laughs> Stay with me. That's just visuals. I'm talking deeper than visuals. Because you're looking for a V of a character to pay your debts. If I could just hook up with somebody who's got some money, you know, in a business. I want a businessman. <laughs> dough. <laughs> yeah, you want some dough. That's what you want. You want some dough. But, but you're coming in it with horrific credit. So you are actually not looking for somebody suitable. You're looking for somebody you can actually abuse. Oh, they don't like this, Pastor Mike. Okay, stay with me and I'm done. Watch this. Helper suitable. Stay with, put it back on screen. Put it back on screen. Helper suitable. Now watch this. Watch this. Here's my phrase. Helper suitable. You've got to make sure you are connected to somebody. You're connecting with somebody who suits you. Here's what I say. A forced fit is a false fit. Don't force it. I know he looks good. I know she looks good. But don't force it. If your spirit is telling you. Jesus, I wish people would trust the Holy Spirit more. If your spirit is telling you, actually, you know what? Ah, I've been waiting so long. I thought this was the one. But your spirit's telling you, no, this don't work. Don't force it. Because I found that any time, I wore a pair of shoes one time, Lord Jesus. <laughs> nah, for real, for real. <laughs> Let's leave that. That story can stay private. 
<laughs> Behave yourself, Drew. Anything you force works for a while. But we can tell a force fit because after a while you're like this. It starts showing. If your spirit's telling you you're trying to force this, let it go. Because I'd rather have, I'd rather be alone than have company and no connection. All right, here we go. G give, give me the next one. Watch this. Watch this. Stay with me. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Look at this. Where's my English graduates? Where's my English graduates? Look at verse 19. Verse 18 and 19. Same scripture. Watch this. The Lord God, come on, put it on screen. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Look at the construct of the language in the NIV. I will make a helper suitable for him. Then it says this. Watch this now. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Balcony, do you have it? Come on, children. Helper suitable, suitable helper. Okay, okay. Helper suitable, suitable helper. In the construct, the primary word is the first word. So the first word here is a helper in the first construct. A helper that's suitable. Somebody who's suitable, they have the abilities, they fit me. They fit my life. They fit what I'm trying to build. Okay, that's good. That's suitable. Helper is somebody who's willing. Okay. Because you can have somebody with the ability, but they're not willing. And somebody, watch this, who's willing, but they really don't have the ability. They will never please you. You'll never be satisfied. Because they've convinced themselves, yeah, I can help you. I know, I know you're running that business. And I remember a couple that I was counseling one time. This was years ago when I first was part of the church, could do everything myself. And that's impossible now. But it was interesting. This couple, this guy, this guy was trying to run a business. He was a, you know, blue collar worker, but he started a business. And, and he found this woman and uh, sister from another church, actually, but Christian nonetheless. And, and this woman was a genius with books. She, she actually was a bookkeeper. Okay. And so, so part, of, part of what they realized was probably a good fit was that actually he's good with the pipes and the plumbing and the electrics and all the rest of it and wiring, but, but, but he's not great with the books. She actually is a bookkeeper. So they're talking and they're sharing, but then, but then they, he realizes soon, soon in that though she was, she was able She wasn't willing unless he submitted to some of her whims. And so you've got this disconnect here of somebody who's able and willing and somebody else who might be willing but not able. So when I, I, I'm checking out what your spirit of tea help it means a spirit of generosity. What's your, are, you, are you here to give anything into this or just to get? Reciprocity, where there is no reciprocity, there is no relationship. I'm going to say it again for you. Where there is no reciprocity, we, don't have, we have an association but not a relationship. What are you bringing? I, 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 know, I know you're... Eight. Am, I make, am I making sense in it? If I'm making sense, somebody shout back amen. amen. So, so not only was God concerned with Adam having a helper that's suitable... But he also wanted a suitable helper. There's a difference. Here's, here's, let me put it plain for you. Willing doesn't mean able and able doesn't mean willing. Willing doesn't mean able and able doesn't mean the person's willing. So when I'm talking to you, when I'm dating you, when I'm trying to find out more about you, I'm not only looking for do you fit me in terms of your abilities, do you have suitability, and do I fit you in terms of my abilities, do I have suitability, but I also want to know are you willing? Do you have a spirit of generosity? Because it ain't going to work if, you, if you're suitable but you're not willing. You're suitable but you're not a helper. And it's also not going to work if you're really helpful but what you're helping me with is not what I need. 
oh my gosh. What are you helping me with? You, th you think you're helping me with stuff, but that's not what I need. That's not me, that's not me asking you to paint my, my door, and when I get home, my windows are all changed. <laughs> and you're looking at me like one in a cookie, like, look what I did. And I'm like, uh, yeah, bro, or yeah, babe, that's good, but that's, that's not what I need. So you're willing, but you're actually not able because you don't even know how to paint. So while I'm dating, I'm checking out your generosity as well. What's your spirit of generosity? Are you, are you a helper? Not only are you suitable, but are you a helper? Not only are you a helper, but are you suitable? Somebody shout back amen. amen. Okay. Something I want to say to some of you, especially to the fellas, but not only to the fellas. Please don't allow culture to put you to sleep. Adam was brought his wife by God. God made it happen when Adam woke up. Some of you don't know the story. You don't know the story. God put Adam to sleep, quick Sunday school lesson, took a rib out, made Eve, and then brought Eve to the man. He brought Eve to the man when Adam was awake. Some of you aren't going to find the right one until you wake up. You're, you're asleep in culture, in worldly wisdom, in foolishness. And God says, until you wake up, I'm not, br I'm not bringing you somebody for you just to ignore, for you to mistreat. Amen. Look down the aisle, look down your line real quick because, and just tell him he's talking to you. Wake up, go on. It wasn't me, it was you. Okay. Last point, my last point, and I promise, here's, here's what I want to say. I got, listen, I, the fridge is full. My fridge is full full, but I've got guests coming. If one of them don't turn up, Jesus, you will are in trouble because I've got, I've got a lot to give you guys, but I want to just lay foundation today. Something I want to say to you though, here's what messed stuff up. Here's what messed stuff up is when the family, Adam and Eve now, they're together. They're established. And the Bible says, of course, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the, any, any of the beasts, any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, watch this now. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You, <laughs> you will not certainly. What? what? Eve, Eve said, well, well, actually, Eve starts entertaining the hissing of the enemy. The enemy hisses her off track. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God, verse 5, knows that when, I've just extracted what we need for today, when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Interesting. The enemy comes to Eve. Ladies. Ladies. Ladies, ladies, the enemy comes to Eve and notice, the enemy gets Eve off track by what Eve heard and Eve got man off track by what she showed him. Women need to be careful of what they hear. Men need to be careful of what they see. That's why you can sometimes see a man with a woman and you look at him and like, bruv, how did you do that? <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's too deep for some people. You're like, this, the, the guy, it's just mismatch. She is like stunning. And this guy's like, you know, like he just woke up. He knows what she needs to hear. Because what she hears affects how she feels. Man just needs to see. And the enemy infiltrated their family. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't miss it. Now here's the thing. They end up disobeying God. Everything was nice. Until the enemy got them to walk away from 
being obedient and including what I call the God glue. And here's what the enemy wanted to do. He wanted to mess up the family. Adam made love to Eve, his wife. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, watch this now. I've dropped down right now to verse 8. Now, Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Okay, that's enough of that story. I'm done. From the same womb, because they decided to follow what was being said in the world and show to them in the world by the serpent, by the enemy. They now lose out on their relationship with God. And from the same womb, listen to how messed up things get. That from the same, and I'm, this is my last thing I'm going to say. I promise. Promise, promise. From the same womb comes the victim and the victimizer. The murderer and the murdered. Simply because they decided to remove God from the family. And then we wonder why our culture and society is producing so much contradictions. Contradictions. The murderer and the murdered. The victim and the victimizer. From the same womb. Happens when they decide to disobey what God said. This is why this month, everything we're doing this month is going to be grounded on what God said. Because Jesus told us, you can't follow the wisdom of this world. You've got to go back to the beginning. There's so much trauma, so much corruption, so much contradiction, so many blurred lines. Because we've removed God. And we don't want to go back to the beginning. If the world's way worked, we'd have more successful relationships than any generation before us. We'd have less emotional and mental health problems which are often caused by the trauma of a relationship than any generation before us. But no, it's the antithesis. And so I want us to prepare ourselves for this month. Stand with me as we pray. Because the couple goals needs to be to produce healthy families. Not perfect, but healthy. Not without flaw, but healthy. If anything that was said today made sense to you, and if you agree that we as a generation need to go back to the beginning, I need you just to clap your hands as loud as you can. Come on. Now lift them high. Father, look. Look at the hands lifted. These are the hands lifted of people who are ready to learn, to pass wisdom on, to adopt the wisdom into their own lives because the way the world works does not work. The wisdom of this world hasn't worked. We don't even know the difference between love and lust. We don't even know the... We don't... We don't we, we, we just blurred all the lines. It's a mess. It's a mess. And I don't want, I don't want my family messed up. I, I want us blessed up. So, Father, I want you to hear our prayers today. Father, I pray to you and I ask you to help us, Lord God, to say that February, we're going back to basics. We're going to learn what the Word of God says about finding the right person. We're going to learn what the Word of God says about sustaining what we found we're going to learn what the word of God says about how we can resist what the world is trying to do and trying to deconstruct we've laid this foundation today God and I pray that it will produce healthy families as we mature as we grow we will find the right one somebody needs to wake up this month 
I hear the Lord saying somebody needs to wake up from the foolishness of this world so he can bring you the right person. Bump into them, collide with them, meet them. Maybe that person's being held back because, watch this now, here's the question. This question's now, I first used this question 15, 16 years ago. I think it's become popular now, I'm not sure, but here's the question to ask yourself. Those of you who are single and searching, those of you who are dating and a dilemma, here's the question I want you to ask yourself. Am I Am I who I am looking for? Am I who I am looking for? Or am I living below the lines? What do you mean, am I who I'm looking for, Pastor? You can't be looking for a certain standard that you're not actually at. So maybe I need to go up this year. Unless you want to marry down. Now if you want to marry down, that's on you, fam. Somebody else can do that wedding. Tab Church ain't doing that. But if you want to marry somebody on your level, then, then am I who I am looking for? Father, I pray and ask you to help us detox from the world and understand that we are supposed to be on fire for you. And help us to wake up, Father. Now I want all of you just to pray a prayer. Whether it's for yourself. If you're single and satisfied, no problem. If you're single and seeking, single and searching, dating under dilemma, ask God to help you to wake up and for you to go back to basics. Everybody praying in Jesus' name. Yes, God. Pass the wisdom on. All right. All right, 9.30, I love you. I need you to give God a praise if you're expecting great things this month. Come on. Hug three people and say, fast in your seatbelt. It's going to get worse this month. Go on, tell them.